All right, thank you for joining us here today. We are so excited uh, that everyone is here. Uh, my name is Dr. Paula Cole. I'm a teaching professor here at the University of Denver. Uh, and this Saturday, we're here to celebrate uh, social reproduction and caring and having great conversations with all of you. Um, it's a pleasure to be in such great company today and uh, we appreciate you traveling near and far to be with us. Uh, and the time you're spending away from loved ones and care responsibilities to do economics. Um, uh, a big thank you to those who made this workshop happen. Uh, Marcus and Carol for leading on logistics, Yavuz, Henning and Robert for leading on workshop planning and the special issue, uh, and my other colleagues and graduate students who are helping out as needed. Uh, I also wanna make sure we acknowledge the service workers who are behind the scenes and have set up today, prepared our food, and are cleaning up after us. Uh, this workshop is in honor of our former colleague, Tracy Mott, who really uh, enjoyed and appreciated getting together to think ideas and talk through economics. Uh, and today is a great way to celebrate uh, his scholarship and his contributions to the economics department here at the University of Denver. I find it fitting that we have gathered on a Saturday to critically explore social reproduction and caring. Uh, growing up in Iowa with four siblings, my mom would wake us up early on Saturday mornings to do what she called Saturday's work. Uh, as you can imagine, it was not uh, well received by myself and siblings. But we would be up early Saturday morning, dusting, vacuuming, cleaning the bathrooms, uh, seven people in the house, so lots and lots of laundry. Uh, don't forget the kitchen or mowing the lawn or pulling weeds, uh, all of that. Um, the work that many of us would be doing today, right now, if not gathered here, because many of us spend our weekends doing that care work. Uh, it's the work that must always be done that can be joyful and sorrowful and frustrating, the work that is often invisible and devalued, the work that women, particularly women of color, are required to do throughout the world, uh, and often for the economic benefit of others. The reproductive work necessary for all other productivity to happen. In planning today, my colleagues and I gave careful consideration to bringing together experienced scholars and young scholars, uh, differing economic perspectives, uh, voices that represent theory and policy, and voices that are thinking from the perspective of social reproduction and the perspective of caring. Um, as we're here today, I challenge you to embrace what is required to be caring. Uh, caring is feeling, it's work, uh, it's interdependent. We have to work together. It's listening, it's being here and present. Uh, it requires give and take. In my classes, I strive to help my students be more caring and passionate. I hope that today will refuel your passion in pursuit of a more caring and equitable world and that it helps all of us to be more caring economists. Uh, and with that, we will get started with the first session. Thank you. Hey, thank you for, I'm so delighted to be here and presenting the paper that uh, I wrote with my colleague, Amchet, uh, in 20, around 2020, and it was, uh, it was based on a very unique data that we collected uh, from um, Bangladesh in a metropolitan area. By the way, I'm Thani Mohammed. I am an economist uh, with the Invest in Child Care Initiative and Gender Group from World Bank. Uh, my work mainly focuses on care uh, and data and analytics. So, here we go, like let's present what we have found uh, in this very important topic uh, in Bangladesh. So the paper is on women's economic participation, time use and access to childcare in urban Bangladesh. And our motivation actually came from female labor force participation. We see especially in countries where there are conservative norms and Bangladesh is absolutely one of them. We see the labor force participation of women is uh, smaller. It's, it's lower than even the world average of 47%. Uh, in Bangladesh, the female labor force participation in 2017 was only 36%. And the most surprising was that in urban area, uh, the female labor force participation was declining. It declined to 30% from uh, around 36% from 2010 to 2017. So that's kind of, we question like what's going on? Why, when, when we are talking about gender equality, why female labor force participation is declining in a country like Bangladesh? Uh, 
So that was basically the motivation where we started. And you can talk about many explanations coming in, right? You can talk about social norms. We can think about why this can be uh, an issue. And here is one issue that we are talking about today is care. Unpaid care, which is very much connected to norms and um, what women does, child care, and that impacts their labor market participation. And that can be one of the causes or one of the reasons of what we see in, uh, in the market. Um, and, and we have seen this in COVID pretty much everybody. It's underlined this, this issue that, and we have seen women are doing more than men. The unpaid care work responsibility for women has increased during the COVID. So this becomes so important at this point to talk about this, that how does it impact, how do, does this care responsibility impact women's economic participation and what we can do going forward. Right, so that, 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 that's the policy question that we are thinking about. So this uh, paper definitely builds on the empirical literature on the relationship between childcare and women's economic outcomes. So in this paper, we actually investigated three parts of it. The first is we checked how, what's the relationship between availability of childcare with female labor, uh, female labor force participation and their employment. So that's the first part. And then we move towards the time use survey. We luckily have the time use survey to, to kind of uh, validate that what we're seeing in the labor force participation is actually what we're also seeing in the time use. And then we are kind of uh, measuring it in the time, um, that how much time women reduce when they have to provide this unpaid, uh, they have to provide childcare. So that's the second part of it. And thirdly, we also checked uh, this relationship of availability of childcare on the likelihood, uh, likelihood of performing secondary childcare. So just before I move on, I mean, when we say secondary childcare, the concept is pretty much like, you know, when it comes to childcare, it's not always a direct childcare, right? You can, um, you can be sitting with the child, playing with the child, and that's maybe a direct childcare. But when it's a secondary childcare, you can think about maybe I'm cooking and somewhere I'm keeping an eye on the child, which is, I'm looking after the child, but I'm not directly um, kind of involving with the child. And that is care. That is the time that you are giving uh, to your child, but that's not a direct kind of care. So we also check that what happens if childcare is available. Does it change uh, multitasking, kind of like looking after the child and cooking and cleaning and what you're doing? So that's the three part of it. Um, and in doing so, when we say that availability of childcare, how did we measure this availability of childcare? So this survey that we have used, which is called a dignity survey, which will def I will definitely go over what's the data and what, what the survey was about. But in that survey, there was a particular question. Uh, the survey asked to the mother of young children of age zero to five years old, and you know, the, the child care need is very high for young children, right? When it's zero to five years old, the child care, you have to do a lot more with zero to five years old. That who would take care of their young children if they need to go to work? So basically the question was, do you have help available? So of course we did not know what kind of help is available. It can be family members providing child care. It can be um, other neighbors providing child care. It can also be uh, they're sending the child to a preschool or a daycare center, but they said they had help available. That means they had support for childcare. So that we checked is as, okay, childcare is available. But just to give you the background, in Bangladesh, we do not have daycare centers that much. And especially the survey was done in a very low income neighborhood. So you cannot expect that they are going to the childcare centers, but the expectation is mostly maybe the family members are the one who is provided this kind of support. So we definitely utilized a detailed time use module as well, as I mentioned, and then we, uh, our paper adds to that that we have checked the time use, the, impact, the relationship of availability of childcare with time use. And this was a very unique data set, I must say, because this data was from a low income neighborhood where this kind of, you know, this constrains women a lot. They cannot afford childcare outside because they cannot send their child to a daycare center, but they cannot even afford to stay at home because they are poor. They also have to go to work. So they are definitely in this a whole kind of like in between the responsibility of going to work, they have to do it because they need to for survival, but they also are in the position where they cannot afford a childcare outside and can have someone supporting them. So this, this, this is, um, this is we thought that very unique in, in that setup. 
So as I mentioned, this is a data set collected by the World Bank, uh, which is called a Dhaka Low Income Area Gender Inclusion and Poverty data set. It's called Dignity uh, Survey. Uh, and it's basically collected in a no -income, low income neighborhoods. And the, the purpose of the survey was to understand um, the female labor force participation or women's work in, the, in Dhaka. And we use that to, to have our, our research. So the data is representative of slums and low income areas in a Dhaka metropolitan area. So again, it's a very urban based survey. Uh, and the data collected uh, detailed household modules from the household and individual level time use. The data also had a lot of information on time use, employment, work history, attitudes, and perception about work, women's economic empowerment, because the data was basically aiming for understanding female labor force, female labor market uh, work in, in Bangladesh. So that, that was the whole, uh, whole purpose of it. So once um, we had the data, we basically the sampling, uh, the way we have actually approached it in three ways. First of all, we wanted to check, we know about motherhood penalty. So the first thing is if you have a child zero to six years old, we expect that there is a motherhood penalty and this is very, very much proven in the literature that when you have a young child mothers, we draw from the market, right? But then we want to see that if mothers withdraw from the market and if I provide them with childcare support, what happens to that penalty? Does it increase, does it decrease, it remains same? Like how does it change? So the way we approached it is in three different groups, our comparison group. The first you can see we started from the base of ever married women of 15 to 49 years old, which is based on demographic health survey, like pretty much a standard 15 to 49 years old. Uh, um, we have picked. So we had a 1,076 uh, sample. Then we asked, like, does that woman has a child? If they don't, we put them as no child. Do they have a child and has child there? Then the question comes, we know that the care burden is higher for the younger child, which is zero to five years old. So we asked, what's the age of the youngest child? Is it six years and older or is it zero to five years old? So we divided the sample again, the people who has a child, they go like, yes, I have a child, but my youngest child is aged six years and older, and my another, another group can say they have a younger one. Then for the younger one, we check whether they have childcare available. What did they say? If they said they have childcare available, we group them in, in that, yes, they have childcare available, and the others are no, no childcare available. That way, we got three groups. The first group is our reference group, where women with no children or children aged six years and older then we have a group B where we are saying women with youngest children of zero to five years old, and there we can expect if we compare group A and B, there is a motherhood penalty because the other group has a younger child. But then the third group is, even though they have a motherhood penalty, but they have childcare, uh, sorry, the second group has the childcare available and the third group has no childcare available. So we want to see how this kind of, this relationship holds. So the empirical model is pretty much initially on the labor, for, labor market participation, we, we checked three variables. One is whether the person is an earner, and that was, there was a direct question, are you an earner in the household? So zero and one probit model, it's like earner or not. The second is whether they participated in the labor market in the last 30 days. And the third variable we kind of checked is worked in the last 30 days, whether it was the probability of them working. So those are the three dependent variables we used. And for us, we have, of course, the interest variable is availability of childcare, and that group A, group B, group C, that was together our interest variable. And we controlled for individual, household, and regional characteristics when we were, uh, when we were setting it up. So let's go to the results. Um, I think that's, that's the where it's very, it gets very interesting. So if you look at our reference group is no child or younger child is six years and older, and we expect that the person with the, older, the younger child will have a motherhood penalty. So if you compare the group B with group A, you can see that when you have a youngest child is zero to five years and old, and although you have a childcare available, although you have childcare available, there is a penalty. And which is, it reduces the labor force participation by 15.7 percentage points. If I look into this, um, the last column, the like column eight, where you can see that LFP last 30 days. So you can see there is a drop the moment you have a younger child. But then let's go further down and say, okay, you have a younger child, but you don't even have a childcare available. So you can see the drop increases. It becomes 27.3 percentage points if you look at column eight. So basically means 
if you have childcare available, although you have a younger child, you may be able to reduce that motherhood penalty that a woman is facing when they don't have any childcare available and they have a younger child. So, um, so from the motherhood penalty side, as it, this is kind of summarizing what we are seeing in the result is basically that compared to group A, you definitely have a reduction. Basically, the probability of women being an ARNA reduces by 17.4 and 30.5 percentage points from group B to group C. It, it, it also reduces your participation in the labor market. In the last 30 days, you see a reduction. You also, women are less likely also to work. But then also, if you see childcare is available, that basically means that penalty that women is facing, you can reduce it. So if you compare the group B and C, when you have available childcare, non-available childcare, you see that there is a 13.5 percentage points less reduction in the probability of being an earners. That basically means that's helping them to participate in the market. Uh, when you have, and then for the labor force, you have 11.6 percentage points less reduction, and for the last one, it's at 15.9 percentage points. So the, the whole point is like then you have, you can reduce this penalty, uh, even though there is one. We have checked the robustness of this uh, by uh, first limiting our group to 25 to 49 years old, which is a prime working age population. The second is you can argue um, that yes, then somebody who had no child or young child, like older child, I mean why, how are you comparing that with the younger child? So we have limited the sample to only women with um, zero to 12 months, uh, 12 years old child. And then last one, we, we reduced it to zero to eight years old child only. So that we, and the results hold. So it's basically, it's the same result. So we now move to the time use, um, whether we to validate that whether this is holding and also to see what are the other things that we can find from this time use survey. So the way the time use survey works, uh, we have used a model which is called a seemingly unrelated regression analysis. What is basically doing is we have taken like um, basically, sorry, uh, we have we had three kind of work. So we have divided this. Your time can be distributed among different activities. One is market work. One is unpaid caregiving work, and another is other activities. And it will all add up to 1,440 minutes in a day, right? Because you're, or 24 hours, you can say, because you're distributing your time. So why it's seemingly unrelated model? Because if you increase the time in one activity, you must decrease your time from other activities because it's, you only have 24 hours. You're constrained by that uh, number. So we have, we, what we are trying to see is also we want to see our, our, we wanted to see whether this labor force participation numbers we are seeing, whether this is also reflected to the market work uh, that we see the similar kind of that, women are increasing their market work if they have childcare avail I mean, you know, um, they have the help available. And again, standard controls we have used. So let's again go to the results. And as you can see, the results is pretty consistent. As over here, we are seeing that if you have a young child, a woman has a young child of zero to five years available, with, even if with the childcare available, the market work time reduces by around one point, around two hours. Let's take it. And then if you have a child but no childcare available, young child, then it reduces by around three hours. So the motherhood penalty basically increases when you don't have this, this support. And again, if we summarize this kind of findings, you can see that yes, it is, it is pretty similar to what we have seen. Um, the motherhood penalty is there whether the childcare available or not. However, if you have childcare available, you can reduce that, that penalty that the mothers are facing and it helps them to go to the labor market. At least a reduction of, you can see the childcare availability, 1.2 hours less time spent on market work. So you can see that you, you, you reduce that. Uh, and, um, and then we did not see much difference on the unpaid domestic and care work. And um, it seems like the, the impact basically, the correlation comes through market work. So then moving on to our, thir like the third one, where the secondary childcare analysis, we kind of looked into, secondary childcare, we looked into two parts. The first part is looking into what's the probability of doing it. So for instance, not everybody does childcare or did childcare, maybe did not report childcare when cooking, cleaning, or doing other activities. 
So what's the probability of mothers doing a secondary child care if they are doing something else? So that's the first part. The second is conditional on that the mothers did secondary child care. They reported doing it, like with other activities. What's the time they have spent on it? So, and that was estimated. The first one estimated through the probit model, one zero, whether they participated, and the second one, of course, the OLS, which is the time spent, or how much the time is spent, sorry. Um, okay, so, and then again, um, standard controls, very similar, and <laughs> like just moving uh, forward. So, as you can see, again, for the secondary child care, you can see that the probability of, of course, doing secondary child care increases if you have a young child. I mean, you can see the comparatively, it's like six, 65 or, if I go to column eight, let's go to column eight, um, or even it, it's fine, the marginal impact of the second, the seven, sorry, column seven, it's showing that your probability increases by 65.3 percentage points or around 67 percentage points. If a mother has a young child, the probability of doing secondary child care is very high compared to a mother who does not have a child six years or older or do not have a child. So that's, that's given. But then the question is, we do not see a we do not see a reduction in there. And that, to us, was very interesting. It seems like when you provide childcare, it seems like mothers most probably come back from work and kind of compensate for it. So we don't see a difference in reducing that. Like, you know, the probability, they still will do secondary childcare, even if you have the childcare available to them, given to them, the support available. So we do not see group B and C has a significant difference, but we see that their probability of doing secondary childcare increases. So again, coming back to motherhood penalty, yes. When you have a young child, you are more likely to do secondary child care. You are more likely to spend 2.4 to 2.7 hours on secondary child care. But what we don't see is no statistical significant that if you are provided with a child care support or you have a support available, still end up doing secondary child care. You still end up spending similar time doing, um, doing child care. So that's, that's our findings um, on, on this part of it. So I'll just, I think I'm running over time, uh, but <laughs> just to conclude, I think this has a very important policy implications that um, we need, I mean, we definitely see a motherhood penalty, but we know that if we have interventions on care, we, we, can, we, we can reduce that penalty that the mothers are facing. And especially also one thing we have to be very careful about is there can also be a double burden of work. So I always say this, like we, our target is not that to provide childcare and everybody will be in the labor market, because there can also be an implication where you can see that mothers are working double time, right? They're doing childcare, they're also doing care, and they are doing overall more work. So the targeted the targeted policy intervention is very much required, even in this space. And also, one size does not feed everybody, so you have to think about this. Um, in the policy intervention side, community-based childcare arrangements can be one solution that we can all think about, and we are thinking about actually in my work. And also, but it's very, and also it's very essential to encourage the redistribution here, because it's like we see women are doing, still doing a, a big percentage of this childcare work. I mean, in my recent study, I have seen that in in South Asia, you'll be surprised. Women do four hours of unpaid work, whereas men just only do 40 minutes. So it's really unequal, and <laughs> we need that redistribution, uh, even though you have all these interventions coming in through child care giving. So um, I'll stop here, and feel free to ask any questions, comments, and here is my contact. Uh, please feel free to also uh, contact me if you have any questions. And if I can take just one more minute. Uh, from the World Bank, we are also focusing on care economy. I just wanted to give you these resources. I can send you the you know, PowerPoint that we, are also, we have also done a policy note on care, addressing care to accelerate equality. And it kind of talks not only about child care, but elder care as well. That's what I skipped. So feel free to read it. If you want to, I'll just give you the, I mean, we can, I can give the slides and then also contact me if you need, if you have any questions. Thank you. Hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Yasuke. I'm a uh, fifth year PhD student at University of Utah. And this is the, uh, one of the outcomes that we have been doing for the uh, state of Utah with Dr. Ruslan here. Um, this is part of the very big comprehensive policy report for the state. We just took the one subchapter and then uh, 
we are currently trying to create an academic paper from, from this policy report. Uh, we try to understand child care workers' motivation in the state of Utah. Uh, why? Because state wanted us to uh, look at it. <laughs> uh, and then the reason state want to understand the child care workers' motivation is the concern that they lose during the COVID-19. So child care workers lose like a very big chunk of this workforce during the COVID-19 and it starts getting uh, recovered, but it's, it's kind of slow compared to other occupations. And uh, according to the latest numbers, it's still lower than the uh, pre-pandemic uh, period. So uh, this is for the United States in general, but we see kind of similar graph for the state of Utah and most of the states in the United States too. So it's just the uh, upshot is to uh, losing the workforce, this essential workforce. In addition to these employment losses, uh, these people are one of the lowest paid people uh, in terms of occupations. So this graph shows the percentiles of median annual earnings of each single uh, detailed occupation in the United States. And you can see that the child care workers in the red one, their uh, median annual earning is in the uh, 5.4 percentile of the income distribution. So employment losses and then extremely low wages. And on the right side of the slide, you can see some occupations which is earning uh, lower than or like almost the uh, same amount of uh, annual earnings with child care workers. So you see fast food workers, you see cashier, you see dishwashers. These people are earning the similar amount of money with uh, child care workers. So in addition to these uh, overall uh, details, occupation, uh, BLS, oh, why does this look like this? Oh, I'm sorry, this somehow it, it happens in this way. That's fine. So and then BLS also, Bureau of Labor Statistics, provide some similar occupations uh, to the child care workers. So these are the similar occupations provided by BLS. Um, they require different um, education certificates, but still uh, nature of the job, it's kind of similar. And they are also the one who are uh, earning the uh, less. Child care workers are earning very low compared to the preschool teachers, uh, special education teachers, and et cetera. So employment losses and low wages kind of uh, poke the state uh, and ask the question like how we can solve this labor shortage problem in an industry. Uh, where wages are low. And in order to understand that, they were thinking, okay, maybe we should look at the motivations of these child care workers to attract uh, more uh, workforce into the industry. So we basically ask what motivates child care workers to stay in the field under these uh, current conditions. So there are a couple of uh, answers we can give by just looking the theory and the literature. So the classical supply and labor, uh, supply and demand framework suggests that just increase the wages and then you'll have a, a lot of childcare workers. Uh, so raising the wages might be the one thing uh, to attract more people into the industry. And then other framework, like most in the classical framework, says that there's not a lot of problem because this is their best option when you include their um, non-wage benefits, providing a flexible working schedules, or like having a uh, children and running your own childcare facility will, uh, will contribute uh, to their motivation. Or of course, like the prisms of love framework, they have attachment to their job. So uh, that's why like uh, employers kind of taking advantage of these people's uh, attachment and these people's value to uh, their jobs. So these uh, possible explanations can be understood by only qualitative work by just like looking with child care works motivation, just uh, talking with them. And we are the two of the lucky researchers. <laughs> uh, the state collected their motivations through this workforce bonus program as a, a part of the COVID-19 relief. Uh, 
And they ask the question of why do you do this job kind of things, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But let's talk about this uh, program in a little bit. So this is a, uh, this is a program allocated funding from the state's COVID-19 relief to the uh, child care workers, and they provide $2,000 to every single child care workers in the state of Utah. Uh, and the eligibility for this bonus was quite broad. So as long as they provide, they're employed by licensed child care uh, providers, they are good to go. They are uh, eligible for this program. So it's a huge, there's a big uh, eligibility, like a very broad eligibility. And um, that's why like so many child care workers, they, they have, I think more than 1,000 applications to the program. Uh, the only requirement is the employment and then filling out the survey. And a survey is not super long. They just ask some socioeconomic characteristics, demographic characteristics, wages, and then lastly, the, their uh, motivation. So this broad eligibility, generosity of these bonus uh, create the largest sample of child care workers in the state. We have more than 7, thousand uh, workers uh, responses to this survey so let's let's see these workers characteristics first before jumping to their uh, motivation so these people are uh, in, in the Utah so the first column shows the uh, child care workers characteristics in Utah and in the second column uh, compare these characteristics with the total labor force in the state so not surprisingly, they are proportionally more female, and uh, they are person of color compared to the uh, total state's labor force. They have a higher share of younger workers. Um, they are less likely to have a higher education compared to the total uh, labor force in the state. Uh, they are earning less, and, and they are like, uh, having a less benefits like a health insurance compared to uh, total labor force. And then lastly, the person of child care workers working in multiple jobs are way higher than the total labor force. So 21% of the child care workers in the state holding uh, more than one jobs compared to total labor force, which is just 5% in the state. So in addition to these socioeconomic characteristics, like all these uh, statistics like gender, ethnicity, race, age, uh, education, they are all in the survey. And in addition to these uh, socioeconomic characteristics, state ask this motivation question. So this is an open-ended question answered by workers' own words. So we would like to better understand the current workforce and encourage others to join the career field. What's your main reason or motivator for working in the youth and early care and education field? So this is the question we uh, spend so much time to analyze. <laughs> there, uh, this, like I say, it's an open-ended question. It's written by their uh, own words. So how we did that, how we analyzed that uh, uh, specific question, we uh, use qualitative methods. The first one we use is the word clouds. We create fancy little word clouds. And then uh, we went further and then look at the content analysis. Uh, content analysis is something mm, not new, but it's kind of new to economists. So the economists uh, recently tried uh, using this content analysis and try to analyze the open-ended questions. We mostly use that paper. They are uh, looking at the open-ended questions to understand the American citizens' tax behaviors, like how they think about tax. So we kind of adapt that to our uh, research. So to do that, we create uh, document term matrix. Uh, basically, it shows us the frequencies of every single word it's used in uh, in the uh, in, in workers' answers, and like and then listed that frequency uh, matrix and create word clouds. And this is the, the 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 main word class that we use. So you can see that uh, childcare workers' motivations mostly. Uh, 
centered in child. So the most used word in workers' responses is child. And it's not, this child is not something like, oh, I work in childcare industry because kind of thing. So we can eliminate all those kind of child uh, wording. So this child means that that's their uh, main uh, motivation to be in the field. And then the second most used words is love. Um, so this, uh, uh, the, 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 the child used as like a twice as love, and then they use love as a second most used word, and then grow, good, make, uh, live, see, teach, enjoy, care. So these are the uh, most used words. So basically we claim by just looking this very initial broad word cloud, primary motivators is the uh, centrality of child, and positive feeling like love, and, um, and enjoyment and professional commitment to their jobs, like help, teach, learn, uh, care. So this is, this is a nice way of just summarize all the answers, but there are a lot of drawbacks to these uh, methods because it doesn't tell us how they use love, how they use help, how they use help. So it's just like a, a very uh, initial understanding of child care workers uh, motivation so we use this word cloud <coughs> as a as a first step and and we use the frequency metrics that we create to create this word class as a first step and then went back to uh, answers uh, child care workers answers and read uh, almost 30 percent of the sample answers to understand what these uh, words uh, means. So I say 30% because that's the formal person so we read, but I feel like I read all, and I know that Catherine read all too, because once you start reading the answers, you just go and go and go and go. So, uh, but like officially we read 30% you know, of the answers to make sense of every single word's content. And after we read those uh, uh, sample uh, readings uh, after the big sample reading uh, with the light of those word frequencies and the word clouds, we realize that there's a three main um, team uh, we're striking. Uh, the first one is the making a contribution to the society. This is uh, uh, several, a lot of child care workers make a comment as a motivator, like they do this job because they want to uh, make contributions to the society. So that includes the child contributions to the child development, supporting families, communities, and making a difference for future. And then the second most striking team we realize after this uh, reading and then using the uh, word frequencies is the labor of love. So working with child care workers create an inherent positive feeling for these people. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the motivation for these uh, workers. And then the third one, it's an uh, appealing work environment. So it includes like a desirable schedule, like the flexibility that they have. The ability to work from home. There are a lot of home-based uh, uh, child care workers in the data. And, um, and also opportunities for sample employment and positive experience with coworkers. So these were the three main um, team that we uh, figure out. And then we assign different wordings for every single team. And we say like, okay, if this sentence, if this row includes the wording of love, we quote that as a uh, team that we decide. So uh, these are the some sample answers regarding these teams. So the first one is like make contributions to the society. The one child care worker say that I feel that we have a vitally important job to help children to be prepared socially, emotionally, physically, educationally to create successful relationship and lives. We do that each day by helping them uh, to develop the skills and strengths needed to thrive in life. So like for instance, this is a really nice example like a uh, nice sample to uh, uh, under the team of make contributions to the society. And then the second one is labor of love. Um, so the work is incredibly rewarding and leads to deep self-reflection and personal growth. Uh, child invites us to see the best and worst of ourselves and encourage us to grow and change in a way no other jobs. 
do. And then the last one is the work environment. Uh, I work as a childcare provider because it's a way I can mo monetarily support my family while at the same time taking care of my own children. So these are the big three broad teams that we create from almost like more than 7,000 childcare workers answers. Oh, five, shoot, okay. Um, so, like I said, these are the broad ones, and and we cr we analyze like more than seven thousand child care workers' answers, and it shows that seven to, almost like seven to three percent of these answers uh, mentions contributions to the society. Uh, around like sixty-seven percent of these answers mention the uh, labor of love as a main motivators, and 15.2 percent of the childcare workers uh, mentioned the work environment as a uh, main motivator. So I say these were the broad ones, but uh, we actually create like 12 teams, and we combine those 12 teams under the broad teams. So this shows only the 10 of them. Uh, we were able to classify 10 big uh, uh, sub-teams under the big uh, three teams. Um, so like contribution of society includes contribution to child development, sense of purpose, contributions to the community, and contributions to the future. You see that under the contribution to society, you see um, child development is a uh, main uh, driver for uh, for their contributions to society. And the labor of law, the in inherent rewards that they're gaining from this job was the striking one. And for the work environment, of course, accommodation uh, of their time with their own family was the striking uh, answers. So there were two more teams that we couldn't classify under any big uh, uh, group, so the money and lack of available childcare options uh, for the workers' own family. So only 3% of the responses mention money as a motivation, but only half of them mention money as something positive, like we need higher wages kind of things, or I do that because I need money kind of. So it's a very low percentage of people mention money, and then the other half mention money as something like, oh, I do this job not because of money, of course. Kind of answers. So, um, and then the the, the third, uh, the other one is the lack of available childcare options for workers' own family. Uh, almost one percent of the responses mention uh, this. So we think that not mentioning money, so or like seeing this just a three percent, is kind of problematic. So uh, because we all do our jobs, and mostly it just kind of provide us some, you know, uh, wages, and then. Uh, not seeing these answer, uh, money as a driving uh, team in their answers was was kind of problematic. So that's why, like, we wanted to conclude that we have to normalize the discussion of wage for these workers. So there's a huge cultural norms that oh, you do that because it's just you know you have to do that. That's your uh, like you love this so kind of thing. So uh, we have to uh, advocate for childcare workers because it's clearly seen as that. They don't do advocate for themselves by just mentioning that they need higher wages or they uh, need more money. So uh, they value the work they do. So they make this make them more uh, vulnerable uh, uh, to exploitation. So uh, we have to push forward to normalize the discussion of wage among these uh, people. So that's also we provide with this research is an empirical support uh, with, uh, to, to prisoners of love dilemma. And also we want to highlight as an economist to importance of uh, qualitative uh, research on unabsorbable characteristics because these are the things that we can uh, measure uh, with, uh, with our quantitative methods. So. Yeah, it's, it's kind of enhance our understanding of the market. So, yeah, that's all. I think I'm on time, right? Perfect. Uh, right at the beginning, I feel this need to um, set the expectations right. After these truly two wonderful presentations, uh, I'm going to present something that's still, let's say, a bit, little bit rougher around the edges and probably also rougher in the middle parts. Um, actually, it's uh, a project on intersectional perspectives on changing geographies of segregation in the US. 
Cares Factor, so it's already a rather convoluted title. Um, it's a project by me, Daniel Gradner, and of course my uh, dear colleague, uh, Linda Lee. And yeah, we are trying to make sense of what's going on in the US. We are trying to make sense of who is doing actually care work, and especially the dirty work of care, or the low wage work of care. Um, we have several points of departure. One of them is, of course, that care and social reproduction is really an essential part of, a foundational part, uh, a part of every society. But if we look at the formal care sector in the US, we already see that the sector is highly bifurcated. On the one hand, we do have well-paying jobs, uh, secure jobs with uh, lots of social prestige and so on. Think of doctors, uh, professional therapists, and so on. But on the other hand, we have also a class of workers that live, uh, that work in very precarious circumstances, a low wage, um, like housekeeping workers, food preparation workers, childcare workers. And this whole formal care sector seems to be, to some extent, bifurcated. Another issue, a uh, point of departure, is that there are historical divisions in the care sector, long-standing divisions, along gender lines, of course, but also along uh, racial and ethnic ethnic lines. Um, and well, these kinds of divisions, they call for a, a kind of an intersectional approach. And we are trying to, we are kind of trying to do that here. Um, these are some points of departures. There are also recent changes in the US labor market, in the US um, care sector. For example, Duffy writes about the institutionalization of care, about um, the prof professionalization of care, also about the commodification of care in the end. So lots of care is now organized not within family units, community units, um, but more and more in the sphere of the market. Um, we do see a huge expans expansion of this market uh, sphere. Um, and we also see a huge expansion of the lower wage sector. So here, this kind of um, perspective on the care uh, sector also ties in with other literatures on occupational um, polarization or occupational change in the US. Um, an economic geographer called Alan Scott, for example, writes about the rise of a new server or servant class. That sounds rather ominous, but to some extent, he captures this huge increase in low wage service jobs in the US. Um, now I was telling you about these hierarchies and divisions in uh, the care sector. This is one way to approach this. Um, here we take the care sector, um, different occupations there. We look at the median wage of uh, different occupations and sp split them into five classes. On the left hand side, you have class one. That's the first quintile. That's the bottom quintile. Those are the really low wage service, uh, care service jobs like child care workers, food preparation workers, and so on. On the right hand side, you have the, um, on the in the fifth group, you have the top income earners, for example, do doctors, and so on. And here we have a measure of relative concentration of segregation, how overrepresented are certain classes or groups of people in certain sectors, or how underrepresented are they. And if we look at the left-hand side and uh, at the bottom quintile, income quintile, we can see rather clearly that uh, women are still overrepresented in the US uh, care sector in this bottom quintile, and men are equivalently, uh, symmetrically uh, underrepresented. Um, and this kind of changes, interestingly, if we look um, at different quintiles, at different income groups, and in the a uh, top income group, for example, we have men who used to be overrepresented, but we can also see that over time, from the 1980s to 2020, this kind of change has uh, changed, and now we have kind of parity in this top income uh, care jobs. Now, that's one way of looking uh, at these hierarchies and divisions and how they change over time. We can also make it a little bit more complicated if we not only look at uh, gender, but also at racial and ethnic um, groups. Um, it's still kind of the same plot with, on the left-hand side, the poor income quintiles, now split into uh, women and men. Uh, at the right-hand side, we have the top income uh, care uh, occupations also split, split into uh, women and men. And we have different colors for different uh, racial ethnic groups, for example, white non-Hispanics, um, Hispanics, and, and uh, black people. And what we see is, for example, if we just look at uh, the left-hand side with the um, 
uh, with the bottom income uh, uh, care services, that it's not only a difference between uh, men and women, but it's also a difference between different racial, racialized groups. For example, the white women are less overrepresented in the uh, poorest uh, care uh, services than Hispanic and black uh, people. And it, yeah, it's just one way of illustrating these different hierarchies and how they change over time. And there is some positive change, at least, uh, towards desegregation. Now, that's basically this point of departure, uh, and already in six minutes. Um, our question is more or less, how are these, how is the care sector changing, how is segregation changing there, and how we can apply an intersection perspective, and there's, and I'm trying to be a little bit faster now, there's lots of interesting work on intersectional perspectives and the care sector. Um, we really, are happy about the work of Duffy, we largely, largely draw on Duffy's work. But when reading this kind of literature, we, and that's kind of um, the thing we do as geographers, we are always asking, hmm, what are certain spatial differences? How can geography play a role here? Because these studies on intersectionality that are uh, quoted here, they largely look at national averages. And <laughs> our suspicion as geographers, and it's rather lame, honestly, because it's a lazy point. Maybe, maybe it's the national averages actually hide or mask or obscure certain regional uh, differences that are really important. So we are trying to get at the core of this. And we were very happy when we were reading uh, the work of Evelyn Nakano Glenn that she was kind of pointing out this um, already hmm, 30 years ago. Uh, in this quote, she's more or less um, emphasizing that we, if we want to look at segregation, uh, care hierarchies, or labor market hierarchies, that the local labor markets are a very important place to start. Um, we can also frame it in a little bit more technical terms. Care activities are mostly, that, yeah, really, they are mostly non-tradable in a technical term. They are place-bound. Um, what that means is, um, if I think about manufacturing goods, about electronics and so on, we can import that stuff from overseas, from China, from Asia and so on. It's a little bit more tricky with services and especially with care work. I mean, yeah, there's this literature on uh, global care chains, uh, important literature, but we don't just import a service, we also kind of need to import persons. The persons need to be here, they need to be at a certain place at a certain time to perform the services. If they're not at the right place, well, it's not going to work out. So care work, that's our argument, is intimately tied to place, and you can't really offshore it away. Um, we can also look then at the, place them, the places themselves, the regions, the local labor markets. And maybe it's that the local labor markets, they are characterized by different structures in terms of industrial composition, maybe, or cultural norms, uh, system of segregation. And that the, these characteristics that differ from place to place, and maybe they play a huge role in what's going on uh, in the care sector and in how the hierarchies there evolve. Um, so kind of our overall research questions are that we, look, we are looking at the US, we are looking at who is providing the care ser uh, services and how has this changed over time? That's the overarching question. And the underarching question, I'm not sure if that's the word, uh, the, the smaller questions are, can we look at regions and kind of, do we kind of uh, see patterns there? Maybe ideal types of segregation. Um, can we identify something like that? And are these patterns persistent over time or do they change? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about data operationalizations and limitations. So we are using this uh, wonderful source, the US Census data, the American Community Service, in short, this IPUMS data. Um, what we are doing is we are looking at, I mean, in, in the IPUMS data, you have individual observations, you have people in there and variables on race, ethnicity, gender, occupations, income, and so on. It's a truly wonderful source. What we are trying to do is identify certain care services, kind of 
make, make it time consistent, because that's still an issue with this kind of data. But luckily, we have um, the work of Duffy again, who already did lots of oper operationalizations there. We kind of compute these income quintiles. You already saw it in some plots. And then we aggregate this thing on different commuting zones. Commuting zones are kind of a way of approximating um, local labor markets. Now, there are problems with this approach. Um, one of the problems is a well-known issue in the segregation literature. It's a small unit bias um, problem. Um, just imagine five people of a random ethnic or racial group. You can't spread five people evenly across 10 occupations or across 10 schools or residential areas. So if you measure segregation or evenness or something like that, small sample sizes are an inherent issue. And so we are trying to tackle this by um, one, uh, we, we look at the smaller sample size. So there are like seven, more than 700 commuting zones in the US, but we actually only look at 400 of them. That sounds like uh, a huge decrease in sample size, and honestly it is, but still these 400 commuting zones, they resemble, represent about 90% of the population in the US. And the other thing we are doing is we are trying to look at coarser uh, racial ethnic groups. Essentially, we are looking at white people and we are looking at racialized people. And we also bring in gender, of course, but we are not really looking at the, uh, the, well, the dynamics of Hispanic people or black people or Asian people. So here we need to take a little bit of a coarser approach. Um, we have different measurements of segregation. This relative concentration measure you kind of already saw. It's just if the values are really high, then the group is overrepresented. If it's lower than one, then it's underrepresented. We also have this uh, rather popular multi-group dissimilarity index. It's one way of measuring evenness or segregation. Um, we also try to do different uh, indices, like the tile index or the mutual in information index. Qualitatively, the results are relatively the same. So I'm trying to come to some preliminary results. Um, one of the results is this expansion of the uh, of care and low wage care labor. Um, it's a national trend, but of course you also see it in different commuting zones, and you especially see this expansion of the care sector in the in this lowest income group, where in some regions it's about 15 percent, or let's say about between 10 and 15 percent of the total labor market are these uh, care workers. And going to skip over this plot though. One, another issue is that there is some kind of regional variance in there. You see that uh, each of the points is a, a commuting zone in a given year and there is some variation going on. Um, we can also take a look at those relative concentration measures for the bottom income care sector again. And we see, for example, the relative concentration for non-white women or racialized women for white women. Uh, for non-white or racialized men and white men. And we see overall this hierarchy in the care sector persists also uh, across, uh, at, at this regional perspective. There's basically no commuting zone in the US from the years 1980 to 2020 where um, racialized women were not overrepresented in this uh, bottom income care sector. Um, so there's some variation going on as well. Um, and then, in the last few seconds, embarrassingly, I'm also trying to speak about our latent uh, profile analysis, where we were trying to find different types of care segregation in the US, in the different regions. Um, and we, the basic idea of this latent class or latent profile analysis is that you look at observable data, five minutes, Oh, then it's more relaxed. Okay, that's actually really great news. Um, you look at observable variables um, that are different, that there's some kind of variation in the data, and then you try to find some kind of latent structure. Maybe the, maybe the data is rather heterogeneous, but maybe there are distinct, um, not so heterogeneous groups in there. And this latent profile analysis is one modeling approach that can kind of um, explore this issue if there are classes in the data, if there are similar cases or types. So we pool all the data from 1980 to 2020 to have 
like five times uh, 400 uh, commuting zones. We have all this um, observation. And then we look at different indicator variables for, and these indicator, indicator variables, they are preliminary. We are not really happy with the results yet. But we look, for example, at the ra racial composition of a uh, commuting zone. We look at the relative concentration measures of this low wage quintile group of care workers. And we also have an uh, overall segregation measure where we look at horizontal differences. Are you working in the uh, care sector or in the non-care sector? And also at vertical differences. Are you in the um, first quintile or in the fifth quintile? So the question is how dissimilar uh, are people spread distributed about these uh, different sectors? Um, and the results look something like this. Here we have, for example, 10 different groups. Um, the fit and so on is relatively good, but it's already rather annoying to inter interpret these results because 10, 10 groups are already a lot. Um, and these, is, these are all the commuting zone, zones pooled over all the years. On the left-hand side, you have this overall measure of segregation of the uh, labor market. Then you have these uh, relative concentration measures for the bottom income group of the care sector. And then you have these measures on racial, um, racial composition, racial ethnic composition. Um, this is one way of illustrating it with box plots. But essentially, there are single observations, single regions behind that. And we right now ordered all the, re uh, all the different classes, the 10 classes, by the overall extent of uh, segregation. So class 1 is highly segregated. Class 10 is the least highly segregated. Of course, you can see that there is some overlap in this measurement. Um, we can again see that this re we can again see the regional uh, hierarchies of care segregation in the lowest income quintile, with the racialized women being overrepresented, the white women being also overrepresented with some um, exceptions, and then we have um, interestingly racialized men who become in some groups also overrepresented, in other groups they are underrepresented. And finally, we have white men who are, yeah, through all commuting zones, actually underrepresented in the sector. Um, it's a convoluted plot, I have to say. Um, again, we have 10 groups, and they are ordered by, the overall by our measure of overall segregation. Now the question is, are these groups persistent over time, or do they change? And you can try to illustrate it like this. Um, I hope you can see it in the back. Um, these are the different groups for the year 1980 to 2020. And this is group one, for example, to group two, three, and so on. And we can see that in, 1980s, in the 1980s, we have uh, groups with low, uh, low labels, no, low numbers, and the, kind of the majority of all the commuting zones. And if we take a look at the rightmost column, in the year 2020, we have essentially the majority of the groups uh, 8, 9, 10. And since the groups are ordered by overall segregation, we can already tell that there's largely a kind of a desegregation process going on in the US. Um, one more minute. OK. We are still trying to make sense of these results. I will. I mean, I could tell some minor stories, but I probably will um, go to the discussion. Um, Bup, bup, bup. OK, maybe I show you this map for the results. It's kind of hard to interpret because you don't really know what the group stands for. But one essential point is we are missing observations. I already told you that. We are still representing 90% of the population. But you can see that we are missing certain commuting zones that are probably interesting cases. In these commuting zones, you have majority white populations. You have very. Um, very small sample sizes of racialized people. And what's going on there in terms of segregation is important too. But we can't really tell a story about that right now. So some last words. Uh, some last words. Um, we do see considerable variation. But that's such a blanket statement, so I'm sorry about that. But we also do see that there are national trends in, uh, towards declining segregation. And these trends are largely mirrored by what's going on in commuting zones. There are very few commuting zones with high segregation that existed in the 1980s that was still highly segregated in the 2020s. But 
we are still discussing our choice of indicator variables, maybe the role of racial, the racial ethnic composition, the, the shares uh, plays a too large role and we should more f be more focused on segregation measures. Um, we are also thinking about implementing a, a model that explains transitions, changes between different LPA classes. Um, we are also thinking about making it less abstract and maybe talking about particular regions, like what's going on in Detroit, how is it similar or dissimilar to New York, Chicago, um, or San Francisco. Maybe we can also tie it in with this uh, larger literature on left behind places and superstar cities, because superstar cities, yeah, they have all those uh, highly innovative industries and uh, high paying jobs going on, but and in left behind places you have deindustrialization and jobs moving away, but still, in each and every commuting zone, you need care labor. You can't offshore that. So maybe that's an uh, interesting uh, perspective to look at it. I'm really running over time, so I should say thank you for your time. I hope it was somewhat insightful. I would be really happy to hear some feedback, and thank you, thank you, thank you again. So, yeah. <laughs>
it, it could be both of these things. I mean, we could not definitely explore it because we don't have rural data. But I think given my work currently, I am definitely going to keep that in mind. And we can move that forward when we are doing the diagnostics and anything that we do in Bangladesh. Um, you have to pardon my ignorance here. This is uh, a, a context that I'm not super familiar with. So I was hoping maybe you could just shed some light on. Um, so the, the labor, decline in labor force participation, um, does that uh, uh, vary uh, along the lines of, let's say, education? Um, and in particular, I guess what I'm asking is s sort of a similar question. Like, uh, we know in the United States, right, like the, the change in labor, uh, female labor force participation uh, during COVID, for instance, was dramatically different uh, across education. Um, and so I'm wondering if there are, there's like, I mean, I know education is a control in there, but I'm curious about um, the profiles of, of groups uh, who have struggled with uh, labor force participation, if there's a sort of a educational, uh, you know, skills component there as well. I will answer this question in two parts. <laughs> one is you mentioned COVID. That's one thing I am really surprised about to see. I, we have seen that, and ILO has reported that two million mothers have left the market uh, because of this COVID. Bangladesh is different. Uh, our recent statistics that came out, it showed that Bangladesh's female labor force participation increased to 42%, which is like, a, we were like, okay, COVID happened and we are all in the workforce. So that was a surprise. But this data is definitely before COVID and it's, uh, I think, 2017 around data. Um, so one of the things is educations are pretty similar in this group because they are low income neighborhood group. And I mean, in Bangladesh urban area, yes, it declined. I think now it, it sh it's showing a bit of upward movement because of the COVID and we are seeing up, upward movement. But that time, yes. But then this group is, I mean, when we analyze the data, this group was overrepresented. The, the, the way the data is collected, this group, group overrepresented the labor force participation. Whereas Bangladesh has 36%, in this group, it was 68% of participation. And they are low income people. It seems like they have the need to get out. Their education level is pretty much similar because they live in the slum areas and kind of like close by some slum areas, so not that educated level. So we cannot say a lot about these educational differences given this data, but from, again, I'm Bangladeshi, so from my experience, it seems like to me, I always find like, uh, and I, I mean, in, even in other researches, that it's always the high income, sometimes the highly educated ones, because they are from good families and they have good backgrounds, they sometimes we see lower labor force participation there compared to low income ones. They go to the labor market, even if it's informal, because they need that money to support themselves. So we have that informal market as well. And this data definitely captures that market too. And labor force participation in this data is very high, 68%, which is even, even in a normal standard, it's very, it was very high. But still, in that, if you can see the impact, it was basically like there is an, you know, we're seeing this definitely. But yeah, we'll keep an eye on that too <laughs> going forward. So I want to solicit if there's a question for one of the other papers too. We have about time for one more question. And I just want to make sure that there's a question for the other papers, but also that we have a break between our two sessions. Anyone else? Okay, uh, my, my question is for Yasuki. Thank you for your amazing presentation that I had the pleasure of seeing before. Uh, and it's very amazing to see how the, this work is advancing. My question is associated with the religious component in your sample, because we're talking about Utah, right? And so I wonder how much of this, I work for love, my, my purpose is to take care of children, how much of that uh, discourse and that feeling is also driven by the very high proportion of uh, Mormons who do see big families in taking care of children is kind of like a superior type of belief, I guess. And even for people who are not part of the religion, that is part of the, the communal beliefs and share that you see every day or something. So I wonder um, if your data and if this research in particular is capturing the type of community component associated with religion. Thank you. Thank 
you. I really enjoyed your presentation. Just to follow up on what Deborah asked, I was thinking about, um, uh, I really, I liked how you situate the prisoner of love, right, theory about it. And I was thinking, wanted to ask you in terms of selection, like if, you know, if people are working in such a low wage area in conjunction with that, perhaps because of social norms, uh, to what extent do you think they don't bring up money because who would ever do it for the money, you know? So you're talking to a group of people for who, who have already made that sort of choice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Should I, should I answer or? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, these are all good questions. And then when you, when you present something for Utah, this, these questions are like a, very pops up every time. Uh, so I'm prepared, so I'm happy. Uh, so um, yeah, the religious aspect, that's true. So we don't see in our data uh, regarding any religious information that they have, but as a, like a resident of Utah, we know that. That's a big norm and culture to take care of their kids. And we know from different data sources when there's a question like, um, do you have anyone who take care of your kid if, if you are in need? And for the state of Utah, that, uh, the, the answer to that question, like, yeah, sure, absolutely. It's way higher than many other states in Utah. So yeah, that's a definitely cultural component of the study, even we're not able to capture it. But we don't deny that Utah might be uh, a selected country, like a little bit biased in terms of uh, community work and then uh, volunteer works and taking care of uh, children. Um, yeah, but but we just cannot claim anything definite since we just cannot uh, measure it. You may, Catherine, you want to say something? I would point to the, the responses that show that uh, 20 percent of these women are working multiple jobs, so the question about yeah. multiple jobs was, are you working more than one job to make ends meet? Mm -hmm. And 21% of the women, or the respondents, answered yes, and another 12% answered sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that's about a third of workers who answered this survey who are working multiple jobs just to pay their bills every month, mm -hmm. which suggests that the, the wage component is vital. If I, were to, if I were to add to that, I would um, think about the survey and the fact that it was a bonus money was attached to responding to the survey and how interesting mm -hmm. that is in the context. And so I was also curious about the way they might have phrased the questions in the survey, particularly around the world work cloud and like, you know, was it motivation to be a child care worker or was it like to care for children and like how was work centered in the survey questions that might have influenced yeah, it's not about taking care of children. It's about what motivates you to stay in the field as a childcare worker. So, yeah. Hello, my name's Madison Beckner. Um, I'm a recent grad of DU. I just finished my MA. Um, and this paper is kind of an extension of my MA thesis. So I will be critiquing universal basic services and its leading conceptual framework, foundational economics. So it is fairly well established, at least I believe, <laughs> that capitalism is experiencing um, a triple, sometimes termed quadruple, crisis in all of these different areas. So we have issues of inequality and low wages and high prices and not enough time to do the things we want to do with our families and the temperatures are rising, etc. So there have been a lot of various solutions to these um, problems. And one of the most prominent was or has been universal basic income. Universal basic income was the primary topic of my thesis. And it says, let's just provide an unconditional cash benefit to everyone individually, right, to solve these issues. And it does have some pros. Um, it could provide a decommodifying effect for wage labor, provided that it's set at a high enough level. Um, but it is a market-based solution. 
and it does relatively little for um, the emancipation of women, unpaid labor, and the crisis of care. So another solution, and the focus of today's paper, is universal basic services. So um, proponents of universal basic services have essentially looked at UBI and said, why provide the means when we can provide the ends? And so rather than cash, they want to provide universal services, um, an extension of things like education and healthcare in other countries to other basic needs. So this um, concept, this policy of universe, universal basic services is built on this theoretical framework. So we have Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum's interpretation of Amartya Sen's capabilities approach um, and Ian Go and Lynn Doyle's basic needs. Um, and then Ian Go put out a paper in 2019 where he talked about these um, frameworks as well as this conceptual framework, Foundational Economics by um, the Foundational Economy Collective, um, who wrote a couple of books um, about the foundational economy that I will get into. So UBS is the policy proposal. So this conceptual framework, Foundational Economics, says the economy is like an iceberg. The top of the iceberg, the visible part of the iceberg, is this high-tech sectors that policymakers are um, paying attention to, that we want to talk about. And underneath what is, they say, invisible is um, a less glamorous part. It's mundane. It's the essentials. It's everything that can, brings households um, everything they need. And so they, um, their purpose is to uncover this invisible part of the economy and reinvigorate it. Um, and they divide the foundational into two primary pieces, the material and the providential. And these, come, these terms um, pretty much come from their 2018 book, um, material being networks and branches. They use the examples of water and electricity. All households are connected through networks and branches. And the providential being what is provided by the state. So health, education, et cetera. They also talk about um, lifestyle and comfort, though it's a smaller portion of their book. Um, they say it is important to our lifestyles, and they use examples like haircuts and sofas. So the potential. Universal basic services has a lot of potential, I believe, um, in, to address some of the issues that we're seeing. Um, it could provide um, a decommodifying effect of sorts for both you know, the services, taking them out of the market, also for wage labor, right? If we don't have to um, work to survive, um, then there's a little bit of a decommodifying effect there. There's also potential, you know, um, Ian Go talks about more solidarity, equity, sustainability, um, and efficiency for UBS. So a lot of potential there. Okay, so taking a different lens, a different theor theoretical lens for a moment, um, social reproductive reproduction theorists see these crises a little bit differently. Um, Nancy Fraser, for example, talks about how not only do we need to um, recognize a fourth portion of the crisis, care and social reproduction, but we should also pay attention to a structural issue that is creating um, or contributing to these various crises. So um, kind of like all of these crises are symptoms and the disease for social reproduction theorists is a structural tension in capitalism. Um, Nancy says, it's like capitalism is eating its own tail. And so that's structural tension, that crisis tend tendency that she is talking about is 
the fact that social reproduction is subordinate to production. And um, production relies on, but also devalues, social reproduction. So this is the structural problem that she's talking about um, and that can be seen as contributing to all of these various crises. Um, she also talks about boundary struggles where we're seeing those um, manifest in struggles right on the boundary between production and social reproduction. So with that perspective in mind, there have been a couple of critiques of universal basic services and foundational economics. Um, the first one was primarily concerned with um, the ecological crisis and the lack of attention to sustainability in foundational economics, but they also know a lack of attention to unpaid care and the crisis tendency. Um, the other one is concerned mostly with its transfer ability to the global south, but again, note the lack of unpaid care and borrowed terms. And I agree, um, foundational economics sits right here in this like paid care. They pay attention to the paid part of the markets and there is a glaring lack of attention to unpaid labor. Um, they also cite neoliberalism as the primary problem, the primary source of a disintegrating, I guess, a foundational economy. Um, whereas, you know, social reproduction theorists would tell us that this is a longer term um, inherent crisis to our system. And then the borrowed terms. Foundational economics talks about social infrastructure and social use, but um, they kind of employ the terms and then don't really um, get go into that social part and they don't really fully incorporate the ideas from these other perspectives. UBS, as I noted earlier, um, Go says that one of the goals with UBS is equity and taking the social reproduction lens, um, I believe that's gonna be a little hard to achieve based on the way that it's currently set up um, and that leads into my main point, yes, that UBS and foundational economics is taking the structure of capitalism as given. And so the goal is alleviation along the boundary that um, Frazier identified, but not reorganization. So, um, it, hypothetically, they could take the structural piece from social reproduction and um, incorporate that into their theory. But right now they don't see that as the problem, right? And so in, and I'm not exactly sure how I'm gonna articulate this yet, but this is an example from foundational economics that I think was pretty striking. Um, so it's um, somebody getting ready for work and they're trying to show you all the different systems that people rely on, right? But they use phrases like, the milk warmed on the stove. Well, who warms the milk for the kids, right? Um, I think there's also something interesting about them walking to school across from a park and then ending up at work. It's, it's kind of like a metaphor where social reproduction is on the periphery. Um, we're not envisioning a different society um, or a different system. And then, yes, SRT. So SRT has the structure um, and purpose, but not necessarily a unified framework or policy for getting to their goal, for fixing the structural issue. And so, in conclusion, I think <laughs> there would be um, benefits for both sides, to, for UBS to incorporate more of SRT's structure um, and understanding of the structural crisis, and SRT to incorporate a modified version of UBS. And that's it. Thank you.
you for that. Uh, I'm Samantha Sturba. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Redlands, and today I'm presenting a research that I'm doing with my colleague, uh, Nathan Klein, who's Nathaniel Klein, sorry, <laughs> who's also in the audience today. Oh, but I wanted to say thank you so much for this conferen conference. I am loving all the presentations. I think this panel is already like really cohesive and amazing, so I'm just happy to be here. Okay, the main question that we're looking at, and this is work in progress, is how do regimes of childcare relate to the structures of capitalist accumulation? Our main motivation for this paper is that childcare in the United States as the previous speaker just said, is often talked about in crisis. It's a patchwork system, uh, very unsystematic, and with major you know, market failure qualities. And this presents an apparent puzzle because it makes sense to want to take care of children, not even just from a uh, like moral standpoint, but from a capitalist standpoint or from the perspective of the state. There's a lot of research that says children benefit from consistent high quality care. Uh, but this does not seem to be a priority of capitalists or the state. Even though they do support a lot of care work, like elder care we know is hugely financed by uh, both groups, for instance, through Medicare. So childcare presents a little unusual aspect there. All right, um, also this project is kind of part of a broader project that I'm working on of using a particular framework that we'll talk about more, social structures of accumulation theory, and putting a more emphasis on care and social reproduction in the social structures of accumulation framework. Okay. SSA, that's short for Social Structures of Accumulation. It's a theory which studies the long waves of capitalism. It tries to explain why do we see long consistent forms of capitalism punctuated by long periods of crisis. And why do the forms of capitalism change in between these crises? Um, at its center is this idea that each form of capitalism requires a jointly, mutually constitutive set of institutions, economic institutions, political institutions, cultural institutions, and dominant ideas and that together in each successful period of capitalist accumulation, those institutions are supporting profit making. Um, eventually though, those institutions fall apart. They become contradictory. They no longer support capitalist accumulation. That's why we end up with the crisis period. So in SSA theory, the crisis period is seen as uh, when these institutions are breaking down, not no longer being mutually constitutive and not promoting capitalist accumulation. In the crisis period, it's up for debate. What is gonna come next? SSA theory says we won't get capitalist accumulation again until there's a new set of institutions that can do the same thing, jointly promote capitalist accumulation. What that new set is gonna look like is an area of struggle where competing political programs, uh, one will either win out or maybe there'll be a historic compromise between them. And then that will lead back to resumed capitalist accumulation. Okay, so those are the core bones of the framework and we didn't really see care you know, present, except in the like broad sense of cultural institutions or ideology. So with this project, we're going to look at 
um, specific periods of capitalism and how that related to specific regimes of childcare provisioning. So <clears throat> this focus, I mean, this study focuses on one particular time in capitalist accumulation, which is the mid to late 19th century. This is an interesting period because both marked by global economic crisis and also a major shift in how childcare was provided in the United States. The connection between these two understudied, I would argue, in the literature on childcare history. Okay, so the study uh, looks at characteristics of capitalism as it changed in this period and connects it. How did those features of capitalism's change influence changes in childcare arrangements and gender roles? And from this focused case study, we're hoping that we can draw implications to our current context. Again, a time of economic crisis, potential major policy changes in childcare regimes. The period that we're focusing on is called by most social structure of accumulation theorists, the competitive capitalist period. This is when capitalism is emerging as a dominant economic system after the um, collapse of slavery. What this looks like is small, medium-sized comp competitive enterprises. Uh, traditional forms of labor organization, artisanal production, craft unions, um, small production happening through crafted uh, technicians. Um, and we see a massive increase in immigration and labor supply in this period. The state-citizen relationship, a key aspect of how we think about social structures of accumulation, would be characterized by a you know, kind of laissez-faire state. The state did have military and police functions. The state did do land policy and also subsidized uh, railroads. There are changes in corporations' legal structures in the later part. But beyond that, not a lot of social assistance coming from the state. What childcare looked like in this SSA, um, it's weird. Kids were going to work. <laughs> that they didn't really need childcare because kids as young as three, in some cases, were working. That was a not trivial aspect of the labor supply uh, in this period. Children, um, you know, on their off time or children who weren't working uh, were often cared for by these private charity organizations financed by rich capitalist, like wives basically, uh, during this period, like a sort of socialite aspect of charity that was important in putting kids in institutions to try to care for them and make them better kids. All right, kids that weren't at work or in these private institutions, the charity organizations, could be at home receiving mother care while their mother uh, did work at home, like the piecemeal um, production that was happening in the household for um, industrial firms or women took in boarders during this time period, that would finance, give them some income so that they could take care of their kids. And also it was common in this period for women to perform uh, domestic labor chores, like take in laundry from their neighbors, do that for pay, and then be able to take care of their kids and do the laundry at the same time. In the late 19th century, there was a general economic crisis. 
what this crisis did in the SSA framework is shifted institutions. A new set emerged to re-continue uh, capitalist accumulation. The new set of institutions shifted from the small competitive businesses to large concentrated monopolies. So there was a lot of merger activity during this time and a high concentration of capitalist wealth. The labor process totally changed. Uh, it became more homogenized. It happened inside of the large firms um, and was not uh, so much your craft, right, that you're doing in your house. It's you're working with a bunch of people doing this job in a factory. All right. Uh, the state citizen relationship also changed in this crisis, and we begin to see uh, the state becoming more active in resolving collective action problems. So as an example, Federal Reserve System emerged during this time period after it was no longer feasible for private capitalists like J.P. Morgan to finance the financial system. Uh, so what had previously been the realm of individual capitalists becomes part of the new state regime. Childcare also massively changed in this crisis. Uh, the old arrangements were not, no longer consistent with the new requirements of capital accumulation. So in-home peace work, that wasn't compatible with the large-scale homogenized production. Borders become prohibited by social policy and child labor also um, inconsistent with the new labor regime becomes illegal towards the later part of this era. Okay, as children can't go to work and their moms can't take care of them in their part-time work, that we see this new debate emerge in American policy over who should take care of the kids. Um, and there are two competing groups. One group which uh, wanted to continue the private charity model uh, by providing daycares for children for, so that their poor mothers could go to work. You know, worst case, it's not ideal, but if women have to work, then charity, the idea was keep their kids safe in these charitable daycare institutions. Uh, a competing policy proposal was mother's pensions at this time. Small amounts of money from the state to women with kids who didn't have income. Uh, so that they would get income from the state, they would do their work taking care of kids at, house, at the house. And they explicitly talked about this as work. They said, this is like the payments that we give to soldiers. We'll just give to mothers. They're doing work in their house they should get paid for it. The mother's pensions won out over the daycare movement. It's a long literature on why this happened. Uh, but this dramatically changed the organization of childcare in this period. Private charity shrunk its impact um, not as important as new capitalists are taking over, right? Not the same socialite families. And the state takes on this new role through offering pensions. Uh, the state bureaucracy expands massively during this time period to organize these payments. And ultimately, uh, these payments, people do connect them as like the precursor to the modern welfare state and aid to family with dependent children. Okay, so our analysis says that this isn't coincidence. This capitalist regime change and the childcare regime change are 
related uh, and significant. So it was no longer possible for private capitalist charity to provide daycare. It, that had to become a state responsibility. And as we said, that's kind of paralleling this move from paternalist capitalist companies to uh, state duties. Okay. Um, this aspect of why mother's pensions arise during this time period, why there's a uh, big debate over how children should be cared for, largely focuses on uh, issues of culture, gender norms, and like construction of motherhood. The crisis and the shift in the economic institution is underappreciated in the literature. Uh, that brings up an possible and important question for us to consider now, like I mentioned. As we're in a possible, some people would argue, a crisis of capitalism, right? Uh, can we see now a change in the childcare regime associated with possible uh, changes in capitalism? And there was a lot of hope for this during the Build Back Better administration. I was floored hearing people talk about childcare as infrastructure. The connection between childcare and physical infrastructure, I thought, that's totally different. We haven't heard anything like this. Um, and so can we connect, yeah, these two ideas? If we were gonna learn anything from our historical study uh, so that we could apply it to our current study, this is the main conclusion that comes out to us so far. Uh, capitalist self-interest isn't going to create changes in childcare regimes. That's not what created the change in the previous period, and we can't expect it to give us a new childcare regime in this period. Instead, uh, a melding of broad-based labor movements and movements for childcare are the p most promising aspect for you know, getting the benefit out of this crisis and finding a new regime of capitalism and, and childcare. So I'll end there. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sonia. Um, I have the enviable task of going last, so I hope I still have attention. Um, I'm a first, oh, I've just finished my first year of my PhD at University College London. Um, I actually, I have a degree in economics from 10 years ago, but then ended up studying more development studies, and I'm based in the development department at UCL. Uh, so my topic is quite, it's feminist economics, but also interdisciplinary. Um, and I absolutely love this conference and this special issue title, so I'm really happy to be here and present to you all. Um, the paper that I'm presenting is one that I've developed over the first year of my PhD as I sort of form the argument of what I'm going to do and my fieldwork. Um, and the working title is around decolonizing methodologies, alternative, alternative approaches to studying women's unpaid care in the global south. So very quickly, I'll just run through some of the key concepts that I talk about in the paper and then the central issue that I raise. Um, and then I'll go into more detail around the key arguments and why I think it matters uh, before finishing with the conclusion. Uh, so the first concept I don't think I need to talk too much about with this audience, but it's uh, the, a woman's reproductive role. Um, and this was a definition developed by Caroline Moser, who's in the department I'm in at UCL. And she, uh, based on her anthropological work in the Global South, uh, identified roles that women have in, in these sorts of communities and societies. And one of them was the reproductive role, which is sort of interchangeable with unpaid care and unpaid work. It's around women's unpaid labor for their families, communities, such as childcare, elderly care, domestic tasks, et cetera. 
Um, the second concept that's central to my paper is around representation, um, and in particular how the lives of women in the global south are represented and portrayed in gender and development discourses and then policy and practice by, by extension. Um, and I was very interested in this and how their lives are portrayed specifically by what I call outside actors. So people in NGOs, international organizations, and academics as well. And just for a bit of background, I did work in development, uh, sort of working on gender programs at big consultancies for about nine years. And this PhD was more just an outlet for my critical <laughs> kind of perspectives um, from working in the sector. Uh, the third concept is around decolonizing research. And I don't know if I can say this is a concept, but it's central to the paper. Um, and a professor in my department helpfully sort of delineated two types of or two traditions of decolonial, decolonial the theory. Um, and the first is what he called the Latin American tradition, which was more about actively delinking from more the material uh, outcomes of colonization, reclaiming land, etc. But the decolonizing research kind of thinking that I'm uh, kind of employing is mostly developed by indigenous scholars like Linda Tuiwai Smith, um, who talks about the importance of sort of engaging in transforming how we produce and use knowledge, um, uh, you know, when we're sort of in these outside organizations. The key issue that I sort of raise in this paper is around how, from what I saw in my work experience, the reproductive role is very much portrayed as a burden in gender and development discourse. And this is a very kind of powerful and sometimes all-encompassing generalization. Um, and you know, even in, in imagery, you would see women sort of being portrayed as being oppressed and subordinated in their traditional reproductive roles. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of uh, work around how paid work is more empowering, and there's lots of uh, evidence and links for this, um, for this effect but I sort of feel that it's leading to this binary emerging with, between unpaid work and, and paid work or the productive role and the reproductive role, and I just sort of problematize this in my PhD. Um, I sort of argue that this actually distorts the complex reality of unpaid work and the reproductive role. Um, it's embodied and relational nature. It's, it's sort of being reduced in a way to um, the opposite of paid work. And this sort of came from just drawing on my work experience in gender and development, but my own positionality um, as South Asian diaspora. Um, I'm British Bangladeshi, so my parents came to Bangladesh shortly before I was born. So I've sort of been raised with a very strong cultural upbringing of uh, Bangladeshi culture and roles and things like that. But at the same time, I've studied and grown up in London, so it's, I could kind of see both sides. So when I started the PhD, I thought, well, where did this kind of discourse come from? Where did this unpaid work as a burden for women in developing countries discourse come from? And uh, in the paper, I trace a bit some of the very, very extensive and complex literature around how uh, women's kind of, uh, how this link emerged, basically. So I talk about some of the theorists uh, who began to sort of challenge the naturalization of household divisions of labor between men and women during second wave feminism, um, the conceptualization of unpaid work as, as an economic activity that should be valued and measured, and the sort of more socialist domestic labor debates from, from, that, from that period. Um, at the same time, during second wave feminism, there was a big kind of body of work from feminist epistemologists emerging. Um, and in particular, I found standpoint theory interesting, which sort of posits that women's experiences should be seen as the basis of theory and knowledge, and that knowledge should be situated in, in the groups rather than sort of being from outsiders studying that particular group. So this sort of led me to sort of question a bit um, how that sort of, how that diffused into contemporary gender and development. Um, and I sort of argue that it's, it's something that emerged during second wave feminism and is now just sort of being taken as, uh, I guess, universalized in a way, and taken as probably the experience of women in the global south as well. Um, and when I sort of looked into alternative theoretical perspectives outside of sort of feminist economics, 
I'd looked into feminist ethics of care, uh, African and post-colonial feminism, and these sorts of approaches were much more explicit about the very complex and sometimes uh, joyous and relational nature of, of this role, of this unpaid work, which sometimes got lost in the literature I first read. Uh, I talk in the paper in a bit more detail about feminist economics and you know, the incredible work that's been done to make this role visible and uh, valued and, and factored into policy making. Um, and some, some methods are listed there, but um, ultimately I sort of argue that the methodologies are generally quantitative and thus positivist, and that's just sort of a, you know, it's feminist economists, like, and ultimately we're trained as economists, so it's sort of natural to go towards quantitative methods. But I suggest that, and this is where I sort of started reading into economic philosophy and feminist philosophy, um, I sort of ask whether this kind of focus on measuring unpaid work is leading to a focus on the instrumental value. So, you know, women could be doing X if they were not taking care of the elderly, and, you know, they, they could be earning Y if they were working. Um, and I ask if that's sort of leading to the intrinsic value of this role being maybe lost in the discourse. Um, so, yeah, this is sort of a hint towards my PhD, but I'm, I don't talk about it in the paper, and I'm interested in how women in the global south, in particular Bangladesh, uh, conceptualize and understand value. So, why does it matter? Um, this is, you know, I think we all kind of instinctively know that the reproductive role is complex. It's not all burden and drudgery, but why does it, why am I raising this? Um, and it's very much linked to my experience working in the, in the development industry. Um, and I draw on critical development studies to basically highlight the very clear power imbalance in how discourses are shaped when it comes to the lives of Global South women. Um, there's sort of quite a lot of critical literature around uh, examining the white gaze of development and sort of looking over at the South and seeing women who need to be empowered out of these uh, reproductive roles and, and more towards paid work. And I sort of draw on post-colonial feminists who are very critical of uh, feminists um, who they argued were sort of othering uh, women in the global south as you know perpetually poor and vulnerable and so on. And there's also some other critical literature which um, sort of suggests that sometimes these discourses perpetuate the stereotypes of brown men being you know, uncaring and non-nurturing. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of critical literature out there which I'm trying to pull in. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I draw from post-colonial African perspective, um, which, you know, especially in African feminism, there's a lot more, um, I suppose, argument that the motherhood and, and these roles can actually be empowering for women um, and it's more sort of explicit. Uh, the last bullet point here is more, so when I first applied for this PhD, I did have some professors who, you know, didn't like it at all and would say, what about false consciousness, you know? These, these women sort of are not aware necessarily of the potential of, you know, earning their own income and the time burden and time poverty. And I just sort of, you know, I haven't thought this through in detail, but I guess with a post-colonial lens, it becomes a bit problematic because a lot of gender and development work is sort of outside organizations coming in uh, to, yeah, make women more conscious, I guess. Uh, so why does it matter? Um, the other reason I say it matters is to try to nuance some of the policy discussions. Um, I worked in a think tank for six years and yeah, on a, on a program around gender norms and sometimes it's quite black and white um, just due to donor pressures and, and things like that. But I suggest that feminist economists actually have quite a strong voice when it comes to policy, um, probably more so than a lot of other social science disciplines, so that carries some responsibility as well. Um, and at the moment, this, I suppose, quantitative focus could be... Uh, yeah, like co-opted perhaps by more neoliberal institutions who are more um, keen to get women into the labor force and sort of unpaid work is the next thing to tackle. Um, envisioning a more caring society, I think a lot of feminists 
you know, care about this and sort of having care at the centre of society, and like a few of the other presentations talked about today. And I sort of think this, this framing of it as being a burden or your drudgery, which I see a lot in gender and development, can sometimes undermine that and is a bit of a paradox and confusing. Um, at the same time, there's this uh, parallel agenda in development to get more men to take on reproductive work. And again, it's just a bit confusing to, you know, is it a burden? Is it good for you? It's, it's not quite clear, I think, at the moment, in the discourse at least. Um, and finally, not all reproductive tasks are experienced in the same way. Um, this is more just you know, linked to my PhD fieldwork, where I'm going to be trying to drill down into which aspects of the reproductive role are more fulfilling and drudgery, which ones need to be addressed, um, and so on, and, and, but in a more qualitative way. So at the end of the paper, I sort of suggest, if, you, if you're with me and, ag and agree, that you know, this is quite a... Um, a, it could be a problematic discourse. I suggest that decolonial theory can really help and take this to the next stage. Um, I won't pretend to know decolonial theory very, very well. It's, it's a huge body of work. Um, but from what I have gathered in the first year of my PhD literature reviews is that decolonizing research is, is really about centering the concerns and worldviews of non-Western people um, and understanding theories and research from their perspectives. Decolonial theory has the potential to disrupt taken for granted assumptions and perspectives. And there's an excellent paper um, by Thamba Nathan, uh, which sort of talks about very practical ways of how to incorporate this into methodologies and qualitative methodologies. And I suggest that care researchers, like everyone in this room, um, should sort of consciously engage with those assumptions that we may have, um, you know, having doing our research within Western frameworks. Um, uh, Linda Hoot Tui's wife Smith, who I mentioned earlier, wrote this excellent book on decolonizing methodologies, where she argues that Western conceptualizations of things like time, space, work, gender, all these things are not universal, and that sort of creates, I think, some tensions, especially when we think about time use surveys. You know, if, how is time conceptualized and, and diaries and, that are used to, to gather this? It's, yeah, it needs a bit of thinking if you're approaching the topic from a decolonial perspective. Um, there's no checklist to decolonize. It's a very, um, it's a very exciting field, but it's, it's difficult to really think about it, from, especially if you're an economist and you study things in a particular way. So there's no checklist, but um, I think it's... I liked this quote from this paper that says it's, it's, it's a continual process to dismantle and recreate knowledge, both within and outside the academy. And I liked this quote because I think this care topic is one where there's a clear link between scholarly debates and literature and, and studies and policy. There's a very clear link. You can influence policymakers. You can work with think tanks and NGOs, you know, read those papers. So if we're, you know, in the NGO sector, there's a lot of interest in decolonizing development. So I would argue that scholars also need to be thinking about this in, in this particular topic. Um, so con to conclude, I try to set a practical suggestion. Um, and I suggest beginning with decolonizing methodologies in care research. Um, currently, the dominant empirical approaches in feminist economics are quantitative, and there's a very well-cited paper uh, which found that the majority of care research, um, or sorry, majority of research in general in the feminist economics journal was quantitative. Um, and I suggest that this may be a, an epistemological issue because generally quantitative research takes a more positivist worldview. So my suggestion is not just doing more qualitative work and doing interviews, but doing interviews and, and sorry, doing qualitative methodologies which are grounded in decolonial theory uh, and research praxis. And again, this paper by Thamba Nathan has some very um, useful suggestions on how to begin. Um, and I also suggest following, um, it's, it's, there's a chapter in the Handbook of Feminist Economics by Professor Peregrine schwartz shea who I think is at Utah. Um, University of Utah, but um, she sort of s argues f for using more qualitative interpretive methods in economics. And she argues that this is different to doing qualitative positivist economic 
um, investigations. And yeah, again, I recommend this chapter, but this sort of interpretive worldview is something that I'm very interested in, um, particularly being diaspora and sort of seeing how people sort of conceptualize their lives and the meanings they assign to things which seem alien to my Western perspectives. Um, and yeah, so I suggest these sort of more qualitative interpretive methodologies can give more voice to, to women who are being studied or portrayed in these discourses. Um, and this is very much in line with decolonial uh, arguments that y we, can, we can understand things differently through the lived embodied experience. Um, and that's you know, very much enabled by uh, decolonial methods. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, so more practical things, uh, I won't go into this now, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. There's sort of suggestions of actually how to do this research and cultural brokers is, is one suggestion. Um, but again, this is all in that Thunder Nathan paper. Um, and just to finish, I just like this quote a lot from this book by Bagel Shalisa on indigenous research method methodologies, where she argues that women are capable of critical reflection and to theorize their own oppression. And I think that's a really kind of interesting quote and sort of and this was included in a chapter on post-colonial feminist indigenous methodologies in this book. Um, and I found that really useful to think through when planning my PhD. And, oh, sorry. And I think it sort of creates a challenge for care researchers as well and feminist economists in particular to open up the space for more interpretive, qualitative and decolonial methodologies. Okay, thank you. I, I had a question for Samantha and um, I really like the, I, I think that it's a really good idea to s use the late 19th century as a way to think about what's happening now. And I'm not sure how much of a parallel there is for this in the late 19th century. But one of the things that's happening now is that the, the, the reactionaries and the conservatives have discovered the idea of crisis. And they're, and they're saying everything is absolutely terrible. It's all falling apart. The family is falling apart. And, and, and what's the answer? Well, we need to get back to the traditional white family and especially strong men are what we need. And I was just wondering if, is that gonna be a real barrier to doing anything sensible about childcare? That's really interesting and I really I like thinking about the crisis language and how it's used by both sides. And my thinking has been really influenced by Melinda Cooper, I think, neoliberalism and changing family values, where she argues that there's a big overlap in conservative and neoliberal ideas of the family. And so, I think because she's saying like that spans actually across both groups, it is a big issue of struggle. But gender relationships are also changing at the same time. I feel like the backlash is, I mean, my perspective as now is that the backlash is small, a small part. And I don't think it will be the main barrier to child care regimes, but I like being an optimist. Hi, I'm Rob. Uh, I'm at CSU. And this is also for Samantha. In your discussion of the uh, late 19th century, it feels really strange to not talk about race. Um, I, part of this is because I'm from the US and you can sort of imagine the influence of that in that, but it, I'm wondering how that fits into 
your larger discussion of, of child care. Yeah, that's one of the most complicated aspects because the racial aspect of motherhood totally, totally changes, you know, how it's discussed. Like, there's one sense of motherhood for white women and a totally different sense of motherhood for black women. And so it, yeah, I appreciate the point that it's like under represented in the 1890s crisis and that I need to grapple with that more. I think that both of us have a question, right? No? Okay. So I'm seeing things. Sorry. Okay. Uh, my question is for the first presenter. Uh, thank you all for this panel. I love when you have a panel of more theoretical work. We don't get that much in economics, so I really appreciate it. Um, and I think that you, the discussion that you propose is really interesting. And when we, I just want to take it a little um, more to the practical side. So when we do propose the very fair agenda of direct provision of uh, care services, um, and we do have lots of experiences throughout history that um, moved in that direction, I think that one of the questions, the first questions that raises is how quality of care is associated with that and how to be able to provide fair services, we need solid democratic basis um, to be able to make that agenda advance. So um, related with the, with the first question, thinking about the contemporary state of uh, the contemporary phase of capitalism, if you will, uh, for example, in the United States, in some states to provide more public education is to provide more schools that are forbidden from teaching critical race theory, for example. So how to advance that agenda simultaneously with making sure that those services are gonna be high quality and align with the things that we want them to provide for our children. I think it's the, the question that I'm asking. Thank you. Um, for a very brief answer, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I know that, you know, in universal basic services um, and foundational economics, they talk a lot about um, using participation from citizens, democracy to figure out what systems we want, which needs we want met, how we want them met. But really, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I won't take up much time. I just wanted to add uh, a quick comment about the 19th century. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to say, uh, Robert, in, in response to your question, I thought there was like an, an enormous number of parallels um, in terms of uh, a lot of pearl clutching about the family. Um, in particular, the reformers who were behind the national daycare movement and then also the mother's pensions movement are like deeply concerned, um, one, about the idea that women are working, just in general. Um, and so mother's pensions in particular is a nice, supposed to be a nice resolution to that problem. Um, the daycare people are a little bit more self-contradictory uh, about that. But then second, there's this big uh, concern about the Americanization of immigrant children at the time, because we're in the midst, uh, in, in this period, of a pretty significant wave of immigration. And so that these child care policies are supposed to be a solution to that crisis, too. Um, so there are a number way of ways in which um, crisis is very reactionary uh, in this period, um, I think, that ends up showing itself in the uh, mother's pensions in particular, which become the dominant solution at the end, where um, there are prohibitions on mothers working to receive the pensions. There are prohibitions of mothers acting in, uh, like they cannot smoke tobacco. Um, at one point, uh, I'm reading through the histories of this, and there's a county commissioner who's in charge of issuing mother's pensions, and he decides to cut a, a, a local mother off from the mother's pensions because she seemed like she expected it. Like she was too deserving of the mother's pension. So there's this huge portion of like, this is the way in which we not only stem the, the threat of labor violence, uh, but we also Americanize immigrants. We also keep women um, 
you know, out of uh, a workforce and protect some sort of traditional family ideals. So, yeah, I think that's like, a, in my opinion, just sort of from the historical record, a huge danger. Hello, uh, my name's Charles. I have a question for uh, Samantha. First, I'd like to say great presentation. I like the uh, child care discussion with uh, Build Back Better. Uh, so my question is, especially with the impending government shutdown, I'd like to get your take on the arguments of uh, budget hawks who would argue that, uh, we, that some of these projects are simply unsustainable when it comes to spending. And so, you know, how do you address uh, these ideas that government should start optimizing and spending like a household? And what do you make of the argument that these projects are unsustainable? I feel a lot of pushback to these arguments, as especially like families are paying and paying and paying and paying for childcare. You know, there's so much money that they're putting into it. Like, and there's already so much money like from the other welfare programs like Section 8 housing or, you know, that also become part of money t going towards taking care of children. So I think like it's, you know, from an economist perspective, it doesn't make sense to just add up the costs of public child care and say w the government would have to find all this extra money but instead say like, we're already paying for so much, let's get more out of what we're paying for. Does that make sense? And I think that it could be a really effective <laughs> argument, but I guess it hasn't gone so far yet. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa Bronstein from CSU. I have a question for the last presenter. I really enjoyed your presentation and uh, I'm really glad that my presentation is following yours <laughs> because I think there's a lot of connection and I'm interested to hear your feedback. One of, a question that I have for you is in terms of thinking about care as uh, as complex as it is and how it's used in uh, development dialogues, mostly treated as a constraint, you know, this sort of dreary work that you have to do. And, you know, cleaning toilets can be pretty dreary, but aspects of it are also very rewarding. And so to, I, I, I feel like that the, the care as, as a burden is something that is largely a reflection of kind of neoliberal efforts to increase women's labor force participation, if I can put it that vulgarly. Do you, and, and, and so I think within feminist economics, there's a lot more uh, uh, sort of incorporation, right, of the, of the mixed bag that CARE presents. What do you think about, and I, Nancy Fulbray has contributed to that. What do you think about that in terms of how care is portrayed in feminist economics? You think it's sort of, I don't know, um, uh, uh, bending under the weight of empirical approaches or I'm interested to hear what you think. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is something when I was earlier in my PhD, I was probably more critical than I should be of feminist economics and sort of valuing it as numbers is you know, uh, perpetuating the problem. But as I've read more and more into the literature, it's it's definitely more nuanced in the feminist economics literature. And this is something um, that I presented this at IAFI a few months ago, and someone from IDS, Institute of Development Studies in the UK, sort of challenged that and said, well, it's more how it's being co-opted by the development industry, right? Like, it's, it's there and nuanced in the scholarly li literature, but the development industry likes numbers, and who produces these numbers is feminist economists. So that's sort of where my, my challenge sort of comes in to say, well, if, we, if they're serious about decolonizing, and I guess a lot of neoliberal institutions also are sort of uh, blowing that trumpet, but um, whether they mean it or not, it's sort of something that could be worked together with feminist economists who study um, women's lives and unpaid care in the global south. Um, and just yesterday, I read this really interesting paper about how 
it, it's sort of a very critical paper by someone at Harvard who talks about the social science report and how since um, neoliberal uh, kind of policies, there's a lot of focus within these institutions to measure and quantify women's lives, and that's sometimes perpetuated by women in those regions as well. Um, and again, it's sort of, I think feminist economists have a lot of power, and there's a lot of focus on gender and development in these institutions. So whereas sometimes feminist economists can be marginalized within economics as a scholarly discipline, it's sort of, well, maybe uh, the influence you can really have and is challenging policymakers and these institutions to, to nuance and say, well, this is what we have. And it's not just the numbers. There's, you know, these are all the methodologies we're using. And I am a big advocate of more interdisciplinary research. And my methods are more, I guess, drawing on anthropology, anthropology which is not familiar to me at all. But I'm just so uh, committed to try to broaden and diversify the evidence um, that, yeah, I, I, I definitely appreciate the feminist economics literature is far more nuanced than is coming across in the development discourse. Paul from DU, uh, my question's for you as well, Sonia. I really appreciated your paper, and in particular your um, efforts to help us all think more about what it means to uh, decenter whiteness from stories of care, uh, and then also extending that to decentering the market in that approach. And uh, I would add maleness. I guess one of the questions I'm thinking about is um, if the predominant groups in power had not started the story and discussion, right? If we were starting fresh from that lived embodied experience, what might be the things that come to the surface uh, and what might our focus be? And maybe this is where you're headed with your research, but I was just conceptualizing. I'm like, how would it look different if uh, we didn't start here? Yeah, um, I guess my answer to that might draw a bit from just my personal experience and just how uh, families and communities are structured in, I guess, in Bangladeshi settings. Um, and this sort of links to what Linda Tuiwai Smith was talking about, um, sort of how people conceptualize gender or space. And, you know, sometimes in these contexts, you know, they don't see it out outside the home and inside the home, right? Like there's, it, the, sp the space is not so clear cut, whereas maybe in sort of Western thinking and Western society in the way it is, women sort of see themselves going out to work and coming home, and then there's the unpaid care work waiting for them and you know do women in the global south today who live in more extended families and and different i guess constructions of families and communities you know how do they conceptualize it is it really um something that they you know see as i'm going out to work and i'm coming back and and, and of course if you're doing a time use you know a stylized survey and it says how many hours have you spent outside doing x they will fill it fill it out right they will respond to those questions but it's more about not asking such structured questions and, and letting that come through. But I, I think it, that those sorts of cultural gray things, which are hard to talk about e economics, might come through more. Hi, I, I wanted to make a comment on Madison's presentation, because I think the way you framed it, um, it kind of overlaps with this issue of um, decolonial perspectives, the, the, the universal services approach is very much kind of based on the need to get women out of the home and concern about a, a universal basic income could encourage more women to stay out of the labor market. Or at least that's one way in which it's emerged in some UBI debates. And, um, but there is a variety of UBI that I think um, really aims to both value unpaid work uh, and, and, and yet also not be accused of complete marketization, right? And that's the idea that um, UBI should be larger for people who are caring for dependents, or alternatively, there should be a UBI al allowance associated with each dependent so your child, basically, if you have a young child, that child gets a UBI endowment that the principal caregiver 
uh, can take advantage of. So it, not so much a question as just a suggestion that that I think there there's a connection between what what you were saying and some of the earlier themes. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I missed it. I'm sorry. And I was thinking of the picture. Please don't. <laughs> Just to compensate, you know. Like <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for your presentations. I have a question for Sonia. Sonia. I am. Um, you made me lose track of my thought. But um, I want an elaboration on the difference between diversifying perspectives and experiences and decolonizing methodologies. Because I'm thinking that care work is an abstraction and there's care work in Bangladesh and there's care work in the UK. And what are we getting that through a decolonized methodology that we are not getting from a diversified perspective by incorporating interviews with open questions or just qualitative studies? Um, that's a big question, but I guess the first thing that comes to my mind would be um, things like time use surveys that they're, they've been used a lot in like the UK, for example. But then when you use those same types of surveys in Bangladesh, I suppose it's the decolonial challenge is to think through, is, is this the best way to capture this phenomenon? Um, because if you use a diary with certain time slots and ask someone to fill it out, that's sort of imposing something already, right? Um, so, it's, it's difficult to go back, but it's the idea, I think, that I get from decolonial theory is to not um, necessarily go in with methodologies that you've used in Western settings and assume that they will capture the reality of Global South settings uh, in the same way. I hope that kind of answers. <laughs> I have a very important question. Who's hungry? It's time for lunch. 